Hi, Paul. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me over. Oh, my pleasure. You're one of my favorite guests. You know, you know one thing I like about you? One of many, it's a long list, is that, you know, with you, I don't feel I need like a unifying theme, like this one thing we're going to talk about, you know, because so vast and diverse is your knowledge. That's and so multifaceted example. are you. Yes. This is an example of taking the fact we haven't prepared at all and turning it into <laughs> a compliment and a benefit. You may th have thought it was a bug. Oh, so wrong. So wrong. <laughs> Such a feature. It's a feature. And you are a feature, moreover. That's what I... Let me get back to my theme of how great you are. You are a feature, not a bug, Paul Bloom. Let me introduce oh. us. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Paul Bloom, professor of psychology at Yale, author of many books, including How Pleasure Works, Against Empathy, colon, and the subtitle is important here, folks, lest you judge Paul, colon, The Case for Rational Compassion. So he's against empathy in a good cause and in a good way. Yes. And then, it's never too soon to pre-order, this fall, The Sweet Spot, colon, The Pleasures of Suffering, and the search for meaning. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I thought it up myself. So, um, the, uh, we're going to talk about, I guess, one unifying thing. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff that is related to psychology, right? That's fair to say. Yeah. Um, and we could start almost anywhere. Uh, you want to start with your article? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, publicity. Sh Averse, uh, you mean the, 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 uh, I mean, you have an article too that was in the Wall Street Journal. We can talk about both before this is all over. You mean the one in my non zero newsletter? The one on tribes. One on tribes, encouraging people to, uh, defy their tribe when it's appropriate, uh, and, and show, show some courage, damn it, and stand yeah. up. And when people in your tribe are wrong, say, I think you're wrong. I used as an example, and this is, uh, it was a little dicey. Uh, well, that was the point of it. It was something that I had been reluctant to weigh in on, on Twitter because, because my tribe might have judged me harshly, but it was, you know, in the, uh, I guess it was right around the time of the, of the Derek Chauvin verdict. And, uh, there was a shooting as a tragic, you know, horrible situation where a cop, shot a 16-year-old girl, um, and a lot of people took it to be another Derek Chauvin case, but it just turned out to be more complicated. Uh, he arrived on the scene, you know, it was all captured on his his uh, body cam. He arrived on the scene, the girl has a knife, she's got another girl pinned against a car, she she pulls her hand back as if to plunge the knife into her, and, and he shot her. And, you know, you, there are all kinds of arguments you can have about what the appropriate procedure should be there, but I'm, I'm sure he was acting within uh, the guidelines that he's that he had been trained with, which is that if, if it looks like you can um, stop a, le a lethal act with gunfire, you do it. Um, so anyway, the point was um, that, well, what happened was uh, on Twitter, I was tempted to say, wait a second, folks, you know, LeBron James had tweeted yeah. suggesting that this was just like the Chauvin case and nobody in my tribe was pushing back. And I thought, well, I should push, push back, but I didn't because it's hard, right? Yeah. You've been there. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, uh, you know, it comes under political correctness, cancel culture, blah, 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 bullying, a whole lot of things. But this is what everybody struggles with is the space of, of what you should and what you could, what you can say. And, I would say this is the sort of issue that's been occupying many people on, on both sides. Uh, and here's one thing, thing I'll say, which is not going to be controversial, which is going against your tribe is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know it's very controversial whether when people go against their tribe in certain ways, whether they deserve what they're going to get. But nobody doubts that they get it. And, right. and it is very hard. I once wrote an article, right? And it was very critical of religion in some way. I said God didn't exist and all that. And, yeah, that you know, and some people it, would, some religious people would take that as uh, yeah. taking issue with their worldview, yes. So a founding writer I love very much is saying to me, well, Paul, aren't you really worried about the backlash? And won't this be very upsetting to you? And they say, 
No, not in the slightest. I, you know, they would be conservatives and religious people would do a backlash against me, but none of my friends would mind what I wrote. But if I wrote something critical of gay rights or trans rights or Black Lives Matter or, or a, and it would give a long list, I would be, I would think something terrible is coming to me and I, the, the stakes are very, very high. It is very, we, we are social animals. You will be unsurprised to hear. And going against your tribe means the people you care most about in the world might think that you're an asshole. And even if nothing more comes of that, that's heavy. It is bad. It's amazing to me almost how much I don't want to be thought of as an asshole. Because, you know, right when I when I wrote the piece, uh, the piece, you know, of course, I promoted the piece on Twitter. And, so, you know, a couple of people read at least enough of it to hate me. And... They, just a couple of people, but but like really lit into me, and it was it was kind of clear that they were I don't want to say crazy, but these were extremists. These yeah. were people who this guy going off, uh, you know, uh, first of all assuming I'm right wing, which isn't true, uh, calling me a neo fascist, and just doing like a thread on what a neo fascist I am, and he knows nothing about me. But so this is somebody in theory I just shouldn't care what they think, right? This is not a person of sound judgment, and yet it was very painful. I didn't. Right. I, I I I I had to mute him, so I just didn't have to hear it. Um, I don't know if that's aberrant. You're a psychologist. You tell me. Um, I, I sometimes think I'm more sensitive than the average person to criticism. But uh, is is your sense that everyone is uh, everyone cares about the opinions of all kinds of people they shouldn't care about at all because the people don't know them? Yeah. You're, I mean, your mileage may differ. People, there, there, there's a lot of variation there. And there's some people who really don't give a shit about what people say. But those people are probably psychopaths in the end. To be totally indifferent to what others think about you is not a very normal human state. So it's one thing when some rando starts attacking you. It could be upsetting. Now, imagine it was the editor of The Atlantic or The New Yorker or The New York Times op-ed page or thing mocking what you said. Or it's only liking something that you mocked. Imagine, mm -hmm. imagine it was um, actually one of those people has mocked things I've said. But go ahead. Imagine, imagine it's people who you respect, who you might want to work with, whose respect means something to you. That's really painful. Imagine if you, if you, if you are are in the unfortunate position of people attacking you and everyone chiming in. And this has never happened to me, but it has happened to friends of mine. One, in one case, deserved, and in a few other cases, totally not deserved. Yeah, I've never been really ganged up on, I guess, uh, as, as can happen if you're, if you're not careful. And maybe that's why I'm a little careful. But I, I, ma I made the case, I was trying to make the case that, hey, it's good for our tribe to hold one another in check. Yes. But, because, you know, in this particular case, uh, ben, Sh ben Shapiro, who's in the other tribe... Uh, from my perspective, had gotten a lot of mileage over the fact that my tribe wasn't processing this particular police shooting in a very clear and objective way. And he kind of used that to trash us. He got tons of retweets and so on. I was just pointing out, you know, when you make yourself vulnerable like this uh, by just seeming not, not to be processing reality uh, very, very well, um, you know the other tribe, so it was, it was it was a tribalistic argument in favor of uh, defying your tribe. I guess I think I can take a real example where I will make my statement, which is a lot of people in my tribe think defund the police is a great slogan, even though when pressed they say they don't literally mean it. I think it's actually really bad for the tribe and really bad for the cause. I think it's a, it's a lousy slogan, and I think it's a very good thing that Joe Biden, you know, didn't go for it, and but. So, yes, there's and making that point will eventually help out the tribe, help out other tribes. It's an altruistic act. It's an altruistic act when when your tribe is going a little bit wrong in some ways to push back on it, be a voice of reason. But they'll hate you for it. Yeah, that's funny. I actually did that. I actually. Early on, early on, when defund the police was just becoming a thing. I mean, this is like very early on. I, I did a tweet that um that actually got a ton of 
retweets. And I don't know if this is worth getting into, but because I, I am blessed with woke daughters, I I had I had been talking to my one daughter about this, who had carried a sign in a demonstration that said defund the police. So I had I had become I was a little ahead of the curve here, uh, and, and had talked about it, and she had explained that it's not exactly what it sounds like. It, it, it's like. Take the money, yes. redeploy it, maybe change the things the people we call police do, and so on. So it's not it's not as as crazy as it sounds. And that allowed me to say yeah. in the tweet, uh, you know, it. I said, you know, but the tweet was like, one good way to get Donald Trump reelected is for lots of Democrats to go around saying defund the police. And then I added, uh, you know, it doesn't even matter what the phrase means to people it the, the phrase it it doesn't even matter what they mean by it the phrase itself is just a surefire political loser and, and i i got some blowback but i think that points to the advantage of of doing a little research i at least yeah signaled that i understood that it, they might not mean something as simplistic as it sounds by it uh but anyway i digress uh it's still very hard yeah, and also tribes have languages, you know. Um, and this is actually one reason why I, we look, we both look extremely young, but we're somewhat old, older <laughs> than we look. And it's it's the reason why that's contact with people who are deeply in the tribe, often younger, because it's the young people who drive it. Can drive I just it. say, Paul, you're looking damn young. Whatever you're, I don't know, you look younger than the last time we talked. So you're moving in the right direction. Whatever you're doing... Keep it up. That that lovely apartment you seem to have moved in with seven million books in the background, it's, it's, which is obviously fake, by the way. But still, uh, I I don't think your face is fake. You're you're looking good. So anyway, go it, ahead. Sorry, you're right. We it, both look extremely. You, you but 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 you're um you're just chafing on the fact that the last time we did this, I had another Zoom background, and you went, "Oh, dude, that's so nice. That's a nice view and everything." And you were honestly shocked when I I fell for it. it off. You fell for it. That was earlier um, in the pandemic before yeah, it was the pandemic. everyone had a fake background. Such a simpler time. Um, also, Zoom has a dial where you can kind of de-age your face. I, I, I kid you not. You're serious? You not. Yeah, yeah. Have every, you, and you've used it? Are you month, using it now? Month, I tick it forward a bit. I, I think I am. I think it's always like a default. Is there really such a dial? There Seriously? A dial. Yeah, oh, God. Such a dial. I want out of the Matrix, man. This is yeah. too much. You know, people are going to see me in real life and scream. It's just, it's, so so part of it is, is an issue of, of tribes have languages and ways of talking. The guy uh, McNeil, who got into trouble in the New York Times first trip, and saying Robert McNeil, their their longtime health correspondent, yeah. And um, one of the things he got caught out for was he described. Uh, Don, sorry, Donald, go ahead. Um, and he, Don, he, got, yeah. he talked about thugs, well, uh, and you don't want to dress like a thug, he said. And even I know well enough that thug is now taken as sort of a racially freighted word for the black man. He didn't see it that way. He wasn't up on it. And so he was inadvertently uh, offensive. My daughter alerted me to that, too. She is a treasure. She is. She, she is, is. She is useful. You should. She have should rent herself out as a woke consultant to keep yeah, keep but, old white guys out of trouble. I didn't realize that he had uh, that that was among his sins. I thought it was all about the N word. I didn't realize. No. Huh. I, I read his very, very long discussion. Which quite, I mean, part of his part of his main sin was he's. He's a crotchety old guy who likes to argue mm -hmm. and and get into arguments and say unpopular things. And I think the world has changed extremely fast. And people, students would have found that charming and let's argue with this guy. All of a sudden, it's changed. It's changed very fast. I mean, all my experience is with is with the left. I live in a very left environment. I'm a leftist person. I see. I'm part of that. That's my tribe. I'm curious whether there's a parallel thing to to the right where. You know, the National Review has some sort of cruise, and then there's some guy on it, some right wing guy on it, likes to make out all these sort of iconoclastic views, and boom, he starts talking about Marx, and then, you know, he's tossed off the boat. Is there a parallel? Uh, that's a good uh, question. There used to, um, there used to be a saying that, uh, this goes way back before the whole cancel culture wokeism goes back decades before that but uh 
I, I think it was Mike Kinsley I heard say it, that uh, uh, Democrats look for heretics, Republicans look for converts. That suggests that the answer to your question is no. This doesn't happen much on National Review cruises. Yeah. Um, so, but it's interesting that it's a, it's a stereotype that goes that far back. Uh, I mean, ob- you you certainly can't say that we're not living in a in a time when when there are dogmas associated with the right. I mean, look what they're doing to Liz Cheney. I mean, I mean, you know, definitely. Yes. I think Trumpism, if you want to distinguish that from conservatism. Is 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 a tribe that is willing to locate the occasional heretic and uh, and, Trump, and burn Trump them at the stake. Trumpism uh, is the most extreme of tribes. Yeah. Well, who knows? Uh, who am I to judge? But it's uh, has its rules. So, um, yeah, the uh, the tribalism thing. Now, I wanted to this remind. I mean, speaking of the psychology of tribalism, can I ask you something that I actually mentioned to you in an email? Maybe you can give me guidance on this. Sure. It has to do, you know, we, we both, uh, I, I, I think, uh, well, speaking only for myself, I'm uh, something of an adherent of uh, evolutionary psychology, at least as I understand it. I think you, you yeah. your, your own work is guided by uh, the same paradigm uh, to some extent. Um, and it's, it's, it's long been, I, I think in that, field in particular taken for granted almost that people you know by their nature have uh, you know uh, are prone to various kind of egocentric biases including in the moral realm so when there's an argument you know uh it's well you know we're we're we're, we're inclined not to see ourselves as being in the right and not the uh the other person and um the, the question I, I asked you was, um, I, I sent you a quote, okay? And this is from a book I read about World War I, the origins of World War I, uh, called The Sleepwalkers. And it, it, it says, there's a line, This was a world in which aggressive intentions were always assigned to the opponent and defensive attentions to oneself. And that's one of the things that gave rise to World War I. They always thought the other person, when they massed their troops, that was an aggressive act. When they did it, it was defensive. Um, and I thought, well, this is just like human nature. This is just psychology um, 101. And then, but then I realized there, you know, you know, in its own way, it is a cognitive bias, right? Yeah. But, but then I realized there's, there's not really a name for, the, the cognitive bias, broadly speaking, that leads to a kind of, you know, egocentric bias in moral accounting, right? It's yeah. it, it draws on other cognitive biases. It may involve other cognitive biases. But this was a question I had for you in the email. So that's a good question. I'm reading this book now by Julia Galef called The Scout Mindset. Right. And right. she talks about it. I don't know if you've had her on your show. She'd be even great to talk Shortly about. Shortly before the book was published, I had her on, yes. And she would um and she she distinguishes a soldier mindset where you march in the world with you, you're defending your views, you're fighting off alternatives, you're holding on to them no matter what. You feel good about them, you know, you you and then and that's the way most of us are, and that's what you're talking about, uh, in very generally. Versus a scout mindset, which he argues we should do. You're open minded. You're, you're open to refutation to change your mind and so on. And it's a very interesting book that I've read so far. You have something more specific, uh, about sort of defending not just how right you are, but how morally right you are, how you're mm-hmm. on the side of the angels. Mm-hmm. And I think there's like abundant evidence that that's true. I'll give you one example because it's one of my favorite studies by uh, Roy Baumeister. It's very simple. He doesn't ask a bunch of people one of two questions. And one question is, What's the worst thing you've ever done to somebody? What's the, what's something you've done to somebody that that made them miserable, that caused them a lot of pain? And talk nothing, about it. And nothing comes to mind is the general you know, usually. No, well, <laughs> well, and then the second thing is, what's the worst thing somebody's ever done to you? And assuming you know you you sample the whole world, there should be every act should get described by two people, but they're described very differently. The first question is, I think probably some people say, no, nah, nothing comes to mind. I don't think I've done that. Um, you got to ask somebody else. But but what people say actually is is I, I have heard people's feelings, but the thing to realize about it is I didn't intend to. I was sort of forced to. I had to. Circumstances, but forgetful. No malice at all. And it didn't cause that much damage. Let's be honest here. Mm-hmm. Ask people, sometimes the same people, describe what's the worst thing that's ever and how to happen. And it's, you know, 
The person was a sadistic psychopath. Mm -hmm. He suffered a pure joy and caused me immeasurable pain. That is correct. And and that is that is sort of in a <laughs> microcosm exactly what you thought. You're talking about the, at the global level. There's even a physical level thing. I'm not sure if the, I've heard of the study. I, I can't back it back it up. I can't give you the citation. I've heard of the study. The study is supposed to be really simple. It's the idea we're sitting across from each other. And one reason why I like it is that anybody who's had more than one child will have seen this play out. And here's the game. You slap my hand. I slap your hand back as hard as you slap my hand. And inevitably, the story goes, it hurts. It really hurts. So I hit you harder. Mm -hmm. You hit me harder. And pretty soon, we're just rolling around beating each other's heads. Mm -hmm. And that man is, you know, uh, you know, Israel does something perfectly appropriate and measured towards Lebanon. It is really awful towards Lebanon, but Lebanon responds in a perfectly measured and appropriate way. Israel says, this is disproportionate. And, and then you, the world yeah. gets worse. Yeah, it's... Uh... And it's what's funny about all these things, uh, and there are other other manifestations we could talk about. Um, I mean, one that's not quite in a moral realm is the famous study where they ask uh, co-authors of papers, uh, what percentage did you contribute to the paper? So, yes. you know, like, yeah. did, you know, you got three three co-authors. Did you, were you about 33%, a little less, a little more? And and on average, the total was like 120, somewhere around 120%. So, you know, we, we overestimate yeah. our contributions and I, things, I, unless I, they are failures, unless they are clearly failures, in which case we lowball it. Um, were you, were you, were you going to say something? I have to interject that when I was a professor at University of Arizona for a brief period, when we did our our, our uh, annual reports, we had to put in papers and a proportion of effort we put into the paper. And for one of the papers, actually a series of papers, I put 120%. <laughs> because if I didn't have that co-author, I would have been a lot easier. So I had to give them minus 20. And 20. So, so, <laughs> I'm yes, sure you were right. I'm sure you were right. And I'm sure their view did not differ from yours at all. I'm um, sure they, they, they were honest and put in minus 20. Yeah, no doubt. Yes. Um, and, and, and also for housework, of course. You take a couple. Everybody believes they did 60, 70 percent of housework. Yeah, I mean, I mow the lawn. Surely that outweighs every other thing that happens around the house, right? You would agree. I take out the, I, I take out the garbage unless I forget. Oh, you're done. You're, 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 you're in the black. It's, it's, time, for, yeah. time for a nap, Paul. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but, but what's funny about these is you describe these – to people like one by one and they they chuckle in the way they would if like they showed up in a Mark Twain novel or something as just an observation about human nature that we all recognize when we when it's called to our attention but then we go about our lives and 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 like you listen to people talking about like uh you know in in, in say foreign policy discussions about like America and other countries and you don't hear anyone ever say like, no. "Wait, maybe I'm judging Russia too harshly." <laughs> you know, it just it's like uh, I I don't know. It, it it this is what concerns me uh, and, and about that, the and future. That I think, and that I think has both a psychological explanation and a social explanation. The psychological one is um, in a long list of biases. One of them is the I'm not biased bias, where. Where you add, right. you describe these biases, like, uh, and you ask people, how subject are you to them? And, you know, about 80% of people say less than average. Right. And, and a very small portion say, yeah, I'm really vulnerable to these. So that's the psychological part. The other part goes back to tribes. After 9 11, you didn't want to be the guy standing there and say, well, actually, some guy did say, oh, it seems like chickens coming home to roost. And, and what happened to that guy? You know, you don't, you, you know, no. it, particularly for something like literal war or some sort of battle, there's tremendous social pressure. Even if you don't believe in your heart, to assume your side is right. Yeah. No, it's funny. Uh, I just taped a thing. You know, Slate has this slow burn. You know, they have a slow burn podcast and they're doing this Iraq war slow burn. I've listened to the first couple of episodes are good. They they because I was writing for Slate at the time, the Iraq war uh they assembled the people doing the podcast assembled a bunch of i don't know six seven of, of us and 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 recorded it and in fact i'm a little worried about what if they quote me at all well if if any of what i said makes it out there what what may make it out there but um in any event that was one thing i tried to stress is like 
it was it was there was a tremendous amount of you know kind of implied peer group pressure um to not just not it wasn't just about you know i mean i i was never tempted to say uh you know well this is the chickens coming home to roost even though i i i did i could see how certain american foreign policy excesses had encouraged things like that but even just opposing the iraq war was hard you know which which yeah. I, I think the Slate podcast rightly depicts as kind of a continuous, a k- kind of an extension almost of the 9-11 attacks in the way it unfolded. Um, it, it's, I, what do you remember that time? I mean, you weren't, you're Canadian Obviously. by birth, so maybe you weren't quite as invested, but you were in the United States, weren't you? Oh, uh, what year? Well, the, the 9-11 was 2001. The Iraq war was spring of 2003. The Red Iraq War. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, um, I was reasonably apolitical. I probably fell into the views of my tribe, which was that the invasion was wrong. That, that, uh, that George Bush was too quick to go into the war. There were no we- weapons of mass disruption. But I'm not taking any moral, moral credit for this. Well, this you had two point. tribes, uh, leaning in that direction, right? Canadians and, and, uh, right. and so, and, and kind of academics, academics in, in yeah. psychology, especially probably. Yeah. 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 Hmm. And so, so, you know, you, I, I was on the right side of that, but I get no points for that because it, it was, it was just the default. It's and, funny. Uh, it was easier for me to oppose it because although my peers per se, like journalists, think tank types, whatever, were, were favoring it. I had by that time moved out of D.C. to a college town, and that actually made it easier. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's the question of right and wrong, and there's the question of brave, and they're different. You could be, you could be mighty brave and totally wrong, but, um, but you don't get brave points for making the right decision just because this is by far the easiest decision to make. Yeah. The people I mean, pe- who can't, I'm, I'm most impressed by people who are right and, and who are brave. Well, brave alone impresses me, but right and brave, yeah, they get they get twice yeah. the credit. So, so on. So, this brings us back to this whole courage question. Uh, do you have any tips? I mean, I mean, do you do you uh, do you struggle with this, or do you just uh, remain a politic person in all realms and just just. I mean, you got a little involved in a, in the in in one of the early Yale controversies. Uh, the, such such fond memories, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to talk. It's it's uh, you'll need counseling if we if we yeah. bring this up. I guess so. Uh, but the so, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I've I at times I, I've I've said things which were unpopular and you know and paid the social price and and everything. It's it's fair enough, and to some extent. I think this often gets forgotten. You know, if I say something unpopular and people say you're being stupid, are you being immoral? That's 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 what you get. It, it might feel bad, but they're not doing anything wrong. They're, they're you know, I it's 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 just as much free speech for me to say it as for them to say you're being stupid. And and it might not be what I want to hear. Yeah. Um, I've never had, I think, the sort of sanctions. I've never sort of had threats on my life or my job and so on. Um, on the other hand, I'm not the kind of person who I, I, I have views, I think, which are unconventional, but I know if I started to push them, that would become my whole job. And I don't want to, I don't want to just spend all my time on them. I, I, I'm interested in a lot of other projects. That's a good point. You can get sucked in. Uh... But, but like, but I'll say something before we were talking before about the damage from your tribe. We said, let's just talk about the social stuff, but particularly for a young academic. I'll get into my field. There's stuff which isn't purely social. There was a, a survey done maybe a decade ago of social psychology of, of psychologists. And so most of them go liberal. Some of them are conservative. It's what you expect. But what people tended to say is, yeah, I don't like people who are of the different political tribe. And I will punish them. I will punish them for tenure cases. I will punish them for grants. I will punish them for awards. So so it, you wait, know, in what we, context were people honest about this? I, this was an, anon, an anonymous, anonymous survey, I think okay. mostly of, so, of social psychologists. Uh-huh. And so it's not just that they said, they said, I'm for the most part, liberal. and they aren't very liberal, they're sort of, you know, average liberal. It's not that, that uh, they said, well, somebody who, um, who disagrees with me about gay rights, and I really disagree with that person. It's like, I don't know if I want that person in my workplace. 
I don't know if I want to give the person the award, the, the spot and everything. And and for these jobs, which are incredibly scarce supply, I've been in rooms of search committees where a name comes up and then somebody says, no, I kind of person kind of an asshole. I don't think the person would add much to the community. And then that's it for the name because we got a lot of names. Yeah. And so people, I really admire people who say, screw that. I'm just going to go say what I want. But, but the reality is people, I think people appreciate that, that to be thought of as an asshole for, for holding their view is going to have ramifications. Yeah. Well, it depends on, I mean, I mean, in terms of how, uh, how much I would object to that objection, it would depend on whether by asshole they mean disagrees with me ideologically or they mean is actually an asshole. I mean, it makes sense that, you know, even though, you know, yes. academic departments yes. don't need cohesion the way, say, uh, the team developing software at some corporation does, maybe, um, still, you know, it makes sense to want people who are going to help other people out, not not yeah, gratuitously cause trouble. So, so there's a version of, of he's an asshole that, that I yeah. I endorse heartily. Yes. Yes, I, 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 I do too. But sometimes you hear people say, well, I don't like that person because they hold really despicable views. And don't get me wrong. I could really get along with somebody if they, hold, if they held different views from me because I love to argue and I love to sort of controversy and everything. But that person, their views are a bit too extreme. Right. And... Often there are people, I think, who respond to any disagreement and they don't know this of themselves by saying the person I disagree with, with is a monster. That Well, that gets us back to, to cognitive biases. I, I mean, yes. I, I mean, for example, one of my favorites, uh, which is related to a number of these things, including the moral accounting, is, is uh, you know, attribution error, which in this context means that, like, once you define someone as a rival or an enemy – then when they do something bad, yeah. you attribute that to their character or the technical term is their disposition. You you give it a dispositional explanation as opposed to attributing the bad act to yes. situation, to circumstance. You don't say, hey, they just had a bad day. They're not always rude. You say, no, you, they were rude because they're assholes. And, and, yes. and, and that keeps people in the boxes we put them in uh, initially and, and is, is – you know, is 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 not the only cognitive bias that's known as such that has a label. I mean, another one is is uh, confirmation bias uh, yep. that that feeds into this whole moral self serving moral accounting, you know, megaplex thing. And this is what I'll say, which is somewhat anti the anti cancel culture panic, which is you always hear these stories of the person who says this one thing, this one thing that gets misunderstood, and then they're in a world of trouble. But the reality is, for better or worse, these people are usually assholes. Usually, they have offended people. They have no friends. They have they have offended people in in in, in ugly, unfair ways. They have shown to be, them to be unscrupulous, and then they make their mistake, and people pounce on them. And then the world is, but he just said that one thing. That's so unfair. Well, I think but that's. If, I yeah. Go ahead. But if they were, um, the president of, of Yale, Peter Salovey, is broadly loved and respected and they're a the decent fair guy he could make a really big gaffe and people would say that's a big gaffe but they wouldn't say let's kick him out larry summers back in the harvard days who lost his job was not of the same status people wanted him out anyway so a famously a world-class impolitic person yes who, who on so many occasions had said the unwise thing uh, but was was portrayed very positively in the social network. Uh, was he? Is that true? I, I had oh. forgotten. I had forgotten that he makes an appearance in that movie. Does he? Well, his character. He's a. He's a. It's, it's a great scene, actually. Does that mean he's a friend of Aaron Sorkin's? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Hollywood mystifies me at that level. Uh, I think it works like the rest of the world. But the. Um, uh, Oh yeah, I, I was just going to affirm that I, that I do think, you know, there there have been a number of kind of firings in cancel culture. I do, I do think sometimes it's like they had been waiting for an excuse. It's yeah. like this per they had decided this person was a problem, and uh, okay, it's time, uh, it's time to go. Um, and, and that, by the way, is one thing which isn't just a concern. Uh, it isn't just a concern of people complaining about the left. 
a lot of the firings or non-hirings are people who go against the conventional views on Israel. Hmm. You know, there are certain issues I wouldn't want to hold a controversial view on, one of which is Israel. Because people feel very strongly about it. So wait, but you're you're which way are they airing? Because in different crowds, you can get into trouble for airing in different directions. You're talking about. Um... I think uh, uh, I think uh, there have been cases where people have lo- either lost jobs or lost job offers. Uh, uh, quite a well-known case, Stephen Scaliata or something. Right. Uh, he had right. a job offer that was ready to happen. He left his other job, and then tweets came to earth where he rather robustly defended Palestinians and rather robustly criticized Israelis. Right. And they're all the left, you know, and that was a right wing. If you want to put it left, right, that was a right wing cancellation. Right. Where people came in and, and he did not get the job he was promised. Yeah. I mean, that this is the thing. There, there aren't many people who are, you know, including myself, there, there aren't many people who are consistently anti-cancel culture, at least in terms of the of the cases they complain about, right? Yes. Uh, you know, like this is, I've written this about the intellectual dark web, right? I mean, th- they depict themselves as can- as anti-cancel culture, um, but the area you've just identified is one in which they tend not, not to, uh, they, they were not springing to the defense of this particular professor. I don't mean all of them, uh, but, uh, you know, because it, it's a somewhat diverse group, but... Um, it's it's the re- it's one reason that some people think of the IDW uh, as as yeah. as leaning right and 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 not just yeah. kind of pure uh, free speech. And you know, if I have a view on this stuff, it's it's I'm not sure the language of free speech is appropriate for what we see. I'm not even having to narrow free speech in the in the sort of uh, uh, governmental sense, but but I think what goes on, which bothers a lot of people, is isn't so much denial of free speech. It's bullying and cruelty and, and lack of generosity. It's you say something the wrong way and 10,000 people line up to mock you and then you get fired. Mm-hmm. You, um, you have a view that's compl- complex, maybe a little bit stupid, maybe even a little bit immoral. And people don't sort of just bracket that off and say, well, that's, that's you know, boy, you made a mistake. But instead, they go for your head. And... And that's scary for people that that an innocent mistake or even yeah. a not so innocent mistake should 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 end you. Well, this is this this kind of brings us to your Wall Street Journal piece on yeah. the, the role of intention in um, in culpability. You know, whether uh, it's actually, you know, actually played a role even in the Chauvin verdict. It's not what you were writing about, I think. But, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, the question that none of the counts that he was convicted of required that he meant that he wanted to kill uh, George right. Floyd. Uh, uh, and uh, so so in, in that sense, it didn't really come up. But um, uh, the, so what is your what is your conclusion? I mean, you, you, you told what wound up being a pretty complex story. I uh, it was a strange. It was a strange argument for me to make, actually. Where um, normally I'd be the guy who said, "Who would say that?" Always, says, "Come on, give them a break. It's just a mistake. They didn't intend to do anything." But people are over and over saying, including uh, Brett Stevens in a very uh, quite a nice article, were saying, um, "Look, uh, plainly, you don't punish somebody unless they intended to do the wrong thing. You know, you don't punish accidents or negligence or so on." And that seemed to me transparently wrong where there's all sorts of cases where you sanction people for for accidents. Um, many cultures have a much broader notion of what should be sanctioned that, that, that doesn't demand intentionality. And, um, and so it's just not as simple as that. You, and it, it might make, you know, even everyday life, if, if, if I spill coffee over your computer uh, by accident, by bumping into something, still I should apologize and maybe help pay for your computer. I wouldn't just say it's an accident. There's all these cases in the real world where somebody got to pay the price, bear the burden. And and so it's not quite the conversation stopper people think it is to say he didn't intend to do that. You might say, okay, he didn't intend to do that, but still he did something wrong and should redress the wrong. And then I go double back and I say, which I do believe, that still we're too, we, we tend to be too censorious 
mob psychology plays too much of a role. Purity psychology plays too much of a role. And we just give pe- more people a break. By purity psychology, you mean, uh, elaborate on that a little. So that that's kind of, this is the one part where I get to talk about some some cool psychology. And this is a, a work done by a, the, the psychologist Leanne Young, some of it with uh, Rebecca Sachs. And what they, they did was they looked at the psychological difference between doing something on purpose versus doing something uh, by accident. And there's a big difference. If you, um, if you run over my foot on purpose, it's a terrible thing. If you do it by accident, it's a, it's a bad thing, but it's not as terrible. Except when it comes to sort of purity things. Uh, so if somebody, and this is the harder experiment, if someone has sex with, uh, with um, a sibling or their mother, it's in the, the, the Oedipus case, um, you don't, they don't get off, they, they don't get an excuse for saying it was by accident. Even if you do something impure by accident, you still get heavy duty punishment, almost as much if you do it on purpose. Hmm. The, the Jew who accidentally eats a BLT um, can't just say, well, no big deal. Oops. I didn't intend to. <laughs> um, and so it's not no wonder that the cases where we get to, to get most angry at um, and most uh, censorious about who cares about your intent tend to be cases revolving around sex revolving around race, revolving around taboo. Uh-huh. I think those are cases where the normal moral computations that get played out for physical harm are bypassed and treated in a different way. Yeah. Uh, now, I mean, the uh, you would agree, I guess, that generically there is, well, would you? There is a natural predisposition pretty broadly speaking, in human beings to attach significance to intentionality, right? I, I mean, it, to some extent, in all cultures, I didn't mean to do it. In the in the typical case, leaving aside some of the specific categories you've highlighted, and even there I suspect that intentionality might matter a little, but... It does, it does matter a little. It does. So, so there is there is a generic... And it makes, it makes total sense to me uh, that this would be natural, even in the literal sense of being in in the genes, right? Yeah. Uh, d- does that make sense to you? That uh, and just to spell it out, I mean, obviously, uh, the thing about things that people didn't do intentionally is punishment isn't very effective as a deterrent, right? Because it's not like people who see them being punished can say, well, next time I'm planning to do that, I'll change my mind. No, the whole point is they didn't plan to do it. They just tripped over your foot or whatever. They, 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 um, and, and, and so, of course, you know, a, a deter, a sufficiently kind of scathing deterrent can lead people to be just super cautious and so right. on. But, but obviously the most readily deterrable via negative reinforcement th- kinds of acts are, you know, volitional or at least uh, intentional, right? That, so, Yes, but yes, I think this distinction between intentional accident is universal. I think it shows up in different ways, even in babies and young children. But there's two qualifications. One qualification is that Joe Henrik and others, when they talk about weird cultures, Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies, cultures like you and I are in, say one of the hallmarks of weird cultures is having an enormous difference between the intended and the accidental. You go to other cultures, even Japan, and you do studies where somebody does something on purpose and by accident, you find a difference, but it's nowhere near as exaggerated. And this gets to the second qualification, which is it's not necessarily irrational to to punish unintended uh, acts because intentions are invisible. So often, particularly when dealing with strangers, you kind of have to take the person's word for it. And... If it's and if, if you're in a situation, as many societies are in, where you're not so inclined to do that, you say, look, you know, you um, you you kill somebody of my group. We're going to kill you. And you can have a wonderful story of how it's an accident, but we're going to err on the side of killing anyone. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a, 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 for, the, for the benefit of the society, not necessarily a bad way to go. No, there's a certain uh, logic you, you, you know, within your community, with people, you know, uh, it's it's easier to ascertain their credibility when they claim that something wasn't intentional. 
they have a history right. of saying right. things uh, and and so on. And so uh, it can make. And, 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 and ask Joe Henrik about this. And he says he believes that he doesn't have much data when you come to family members. The intention accident distinction is taken much more seriously. Hmm. This heavy duty because you would trust them. Yeah. You trust them. This heavy duty thing comes in more when dealing with strangers. And of course, going back to the to the American case, all of these examples, the people who tend to get strung out for their mistakes are typically not part of the group proper. Mm-hmm. They're typically people that that are not like people are treated as separate. You know, there's a a kind of related thing that I don't know that I've ever run by you. I should have because it, it's uh, it's something I think is very important. I've never really written about it and in, in, tried to write about it in depth or bounced it off of people like you who might help clarify my thinking on it. But it's uh, you know you you know the old whatever the French expression is that means to know all is to forgive all, right? Yeah. There is this, uh, this, this fact that, um, you know, if you explain what, and, and this gets kind of back to attribution error and, and the idea of, uh, you know, dispositional interpretations of why somebody did something bad versus a situational interpretation. Yeah. Once you start explaining why somebody did something, why from their point of view it made sense to do it, or why they were reacting to certain external forces, and that's why they did it, whatever. Generally speaking, explaining why somebody did something is taken to be an attempt to exonerate them. You know what I mean? It's like, yep. it's like if, if, if I start saying, well, uh, you know, uh, the reason uh, some horrible, you know, the reason Bashar al-Assad... Mm-hmm. Uh, cl- clamp down on the protesters in the first place in a brutal fashion was because, you know, he has uh, these guys in his cabinet who control the security forces and he had seen what happens when these things get blah, blah, blah. You, you get into this and people go, oh, you're defending him? And, and and I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just trying to first, like, get clear on why this horrible thing happened. and yeah. And it's really hard to get away with it. People don't want to let you separate the process of explanation from the process of moral evaluation. And what I wonder is whether that intuition of theirs is not itself kind of part of human nature, like in some sense, you know what I mean? I think so. I also think the intuition of theirs has a point. You're a big fan of cognitive empathy, of, of getting into the heads of others and things. Yeah, yeah which is them. different from feel their pain and yeah. emotional empathy. It's just like perspective taking, understanding yeah. how they see the world. Yes. And for the most part, I, I find your arguments for that tremendously convincing. If you, particularly if you're, if you're in that, if you want to recruit people, if you want to convince people, even if you want to destroy people, knowing what's going on in their heads is extremely valuable. But here's the risk. And you put your finger on it, which is if you know what's going on in somebody's head, Ultimately, you discover, for the most part, they're doing things for reasons. Right. And what this means is, go back to 9-11, you know, if I said, you know, well, uh, bin Laden had this reason and that reason. And then you keep going in it, and someone's going to look at you and say, where's the evil? Where's the malice? Where's, right, they where's want the, there to be evil. They, they want there to be evil. And in fact, at some point, you keep going, they'll look at you and say, wait, are you saying that if I was in his situation... The same circumstance, same belief, I would have done the same. And you say, yeah. And then he, then you you offend your tribe, to say right. the least. Well, you, you freak people out generally, a- a- including probably a lot of academics. And yet, it seems to me that the view you're expressing, if you say if you had been in, in his shoes, is a pretty, what should be a kind of conventional one in the social sciences, by which I mean you're assuming that there are two kinds of influences on human behavior, genetic and environmental. This is a guy who was born with the genes he was born in. He was born in a given environment and a, and a, and a, and a certain kind of view common in the social sciences, which is a very scientific view, suggests that the rest is inevitable, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, in other words, you're, you're being kind of a determinist. And yet the implication of that uh, well, the implication of that a lot of people find abhorrent. I mean, the way I get around it is saying, and I don't, I don't, I'm not just getting around it. It's just, I think it's a very defensible view. Is like, I don't believe 
that retribution is a moral good. I don't think it's good. The, the suffering you inflict when you punish someone is good in and of itself. I think you pun you have to punish people for practical reasons, reasons yeah. of deterrence to keep or to put them in jail to keep them off the streets if they if they're gonna if they just can't control themselves and will hurt people whatever. Um, but it's always strictly speaking regrettable that you make them suffer. That's my view. It seems to me coherent, but that's just me. This is no. This is this is where you and Sam Harris meet. I mean, this is which is. <laughs> Which is no, but but I've heard it from you and I've heard it from him. Which is, if you fully understand how the mind works and you fully understand that people do things because of their genes and their environment, da, 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 the the traditional notions of good and evil, and 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 you know revenge and punishment just go away. You might you might want to put people in prison or even kill them because it makes the world a better place, but you but you shouldn't um, but but you shouldn't get mad at them. Yeah. Now, that's a bit too much determinism for me. But this is why I think when you say, when I tell people about um, what was up with Derek Chauvin and do a big analysis of what he was thinking and his training, his background, yeah. and people get mad at me because it seems like I'm excusing them. Well, you are excusing them. Because because the more you understand about what went on for, for a rapist, for a killer, for a mass murder, the more you're explaining in, in outside of the language of morality. And this is this is not a small this is not small potatoes. This is a, an enormous tension in my field that we often don't talk about enough, which is that the struggle between causal explanations and the normal moral and spiritual way of thinking about things. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's different. Um, you know, on the other hand, uh, the, the takeaway that you should feel compassion for everyone and that you should uh, uh, never take pleasure in suffering per se is one that you hear in a number of spiritual traditions. Yeah. Um, and and uh, but it, it's hard to abide by. And, and I certainly don't profess to actually abide by it in the sense of never feeling retributive and, and never taking uh, profound pleasure in the suffering of my enemies. I certainly don't I, mean to I, suggest I've that I'm that kind the, of person. I've listened to the power room. You've listened to, the, oh, wow. The uh, Yeah, so that's a little, you know, it's always scary when I realize there's someone I know listening to the parrot room. Um, I, like somebody I, who's, re who's read your journals or your green diaries or something. I should say, for people who don't know what we're talking about, I do a podcast every Friday with, Frenemy, long-standing frenemy, Mickey Kaus, uh, and then we, you know, we have a Patreon thing, and uh, one of the things you get if you're a patron, for better or worse, is access to quote the Parrot Room, where we do our after hours uh, podcast uh, in front of a more intimate audience, and perhaps uh, uh, sometimes um, go overboard. Uh, in in the in the faults, uh, you know, under the false impression that almost no one's watching. Apparently, you are. <laughs> I'm, I find it uh, I find it power room very enjoyable. This is not, by the way, something we had pre planned. That this is a way for you to introduce the topic of the power room. But um, but it shows. It also shows a dichotomy in people, which is on the one hand, I think you think very sincerely that facts about the way people's behavior emerges um, means that you shouldn't hate them, that you shouldn't want want retribution upon them, that you should maybe even treat them all with love. But at the same time, being, you know, being a product of Darwinian natural selection, sometimes you really delight in seeing what, what goes around comes around. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not perfect. I still think the, the, the correct the correct way of being is to not take pleasure in the suffering and always consider punishment a regrettable necessity. Uh, yeah. And in fact, it, it not infrequently um, will be a necessity. I mean, the, the thing in a way I most regret in this realm is not. I, I mean, the fact that people may take pleasure in knowing that retribution has uh, has been had uh I'm not really crusading against that. Um, what bothers me more 
is is what I alluded to earlier that when you try to explain why people are doing things, you get attacked for being an apologist. Yeah. And, and 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 this is something. By the way, this is something where I think all all opponents of cancel culture should jump to my defense here. But this is this is another realm where the application is pretty selective. Like if you if you see someone accused of being an Assad apologist or a Putin apologist or a, an apologist of Xi Jinping or something, not a lot of people are jumping in and saying, wait a second, it's, it's important that we hear from people who want to try to illuminate the perspective of even people who want to actually defend them, you know, yeah. but certainly people who want to illuminate uh, the forces impinging on their behavior, uh, you don't. You know, again, we're all selective about this, you know, and and most of the anti-cancel culture people are focused on 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 woke cancel culture and and uh, and, you know, a few issues around social justice, yeah. warriordom and stuff. Yeah. I and mean, you don't you don't lament that. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer. I will lament it. I will lament it enough for both of us. I deeply I'll, lament I'll, it. I have two I'll, persons worth of lamentation. I'll lament something else later on to uh, cover up my lament. Okay, well, we'll give you... Said, we, I, we can pause what, while you think up what you're going to lament. But I will say something, which maybe is kind of sad. But um, not what I'm saying is sad, but the topic is sad. But, but it's that I agree with what you're saying about cognitive empathy and the like. But... For the most part, what we see in discussions among the vast majority of people who aren't actually involved in these issues in any way, just shooting the ship, just talking about things, isn't in any way an interest in getting at the truth. It's an interest in being funny. It's an interest in showing off their affiliation and showing off what they've read and everything. Sometimes in supporting their friends, sometimes good motivations, but figuring out the truth, like what really is up with Putin? Is, is very low on their priorities. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who write a lot about these issues, if you say, hey, I have a book that will answer all your questions about Putin, they'd say, who cares? I'm not, you know, it's not, it's not my, my business. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's been a lot of time on Twitter arguing with Glenn Greenwald about it or whatever because because it's, 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 it's social, it's fun. Well, and because the incentive structure on social media is to increase your number of followers and retweets and so on. And that encourages uh, yes. virtue signaling within your tribe and, and preening. And, and it rewards antagonism with the other tribe. So if, if yes. you're, if you get into a fight with Glenn Greenwald or anybody else, that's the best thing you can do because you must have a tribe that doesn't like that person and they will, and they will reward you and your following will grow. I mean, it really, uh, you, you know, it, it's weird, uh, in a certain sense, it, it, it creates a situation when you're, where you're getting positive reinforcement, not from your peers in the traditional sense. I mean, it, it, traditionally by peers, we've met people, you know, you know, you don't know who these people are who are retweeting you very often and, and liking you and the new followers you're getting by definition almost you don't know. You almost never know people who didn't follow you until, until your latest, uh, act of virtue signaling. Um, and yet they are guiding your, um, behavior. And I think, let me just quickly say one related thing is like, I remember back before, uh, you know, journalists got their feedback via clicks, right? And, and likes and so on. You know, back before you had this immediate feedback about how many people were reading your piece, how many people liked it. Like, you know, when I was at the New Republic, like in the late 80s, early 90s, the kind of feedback you got was like uh, somebody in the office next to you had been at a party where somebody said something nice about this article you wrote. So it was really peer in a very restricted yeah. and, you know, kind of, quote, elite sense, elite in the yeah. social science sense of the term. Um that's just a totally different world in terms of uh, – and I don't know that we have yet figured out how to uh, channel the forces of the new world in a wholly positive direction. 
the, the, the New Republic, if I remember right, has something like the slogan a long time ago that their the magazine read on Air Force One. The in-flight magazine of Air Force One was probably an actual ad slogan of the New Republic. And, some, and, I think they had a picture of Kennedy. What's that? captures the idea, which is, which is we're not going to go for clicks. The right people, even the right person will read it. And there still are elite magazines, but even they pay a lot of attention to social media and and that becomes a different world. Yeah, yeah. And the dynamic has changed. I, I, if I remember right, it was non-zero got praised by uh, by Clinton, by Bill Clinton. Yes. The book. So that must have been, and that, that's just coming out of you by surprise, like totally. One day. That must have I, been. Nice. I remember the moment completely. It, it's a very, it's very funny. Well, I, I, anyway, my daughter, my daughter was about three, and. Uh, and she, um, well, I have two daughters. One of them was, I don't know, three, four, five, something. And I was, somebody was telling me on the phone that Clinton was starting to talk about my books. And, and my younger daughter was up and she was doing this thing where she had these uh, handcuffs made of construction paper. Yeah. And she was putting these handcuffs around me. And I had this call. And I just, and I heard this that Clinton was talking about my book. And, and then I, I hung up and, and then I went back to playing along and I said, you put handcuffs on me? And she said, don't worry, they're golden handcuffs. Now, I later asked myself, is that a good metaphor for being endorsed by the establishment? I leave that question with you, Paul. That's a great Be- question. It is a great question. But anyway, it, 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 it didn't happen. I didn't remain the darling of the establishment and have my speech constrained uh, by uh, desire to stay in good terms with Bill Clinton, I think. I've never... I, 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 I did not get invited to the right parties even after that. Philip Roth, I, I read the biography, had a story where he was, um, he what met Bill Clinton, but later on he wrote The Human Stain, and then they, which had Monica Lewinsky at the core of it. Oh, did and it? Bill Clinton, and he saw Bill Clinton at a funeral and moved to shake his hand, and then Bill Clinton kind of glared at him and turned away and uh, because he read the part. Anyway, I was going to think that the thing, we, we could double back to that. But the thing about Clinton is, you know what's even better than that? Every author would hope that when Trump was president, they'd get a mean treat by tweet by by Trump. Right. You know. Right. You know. Um. Um. Lazy. Lazy. Paul Bloom's book. You know, fails to capture the full understanding of the moral psychology. It's not a very Trumpish. Did you ever? You did. You did never have the good fortune of actually getting that tweet. No, I never got the man's attention. But but you're but the thing is, you're right. Social cachet could be could be done by getting somebody to, to praise you, but also getting enough people on the other side to, they, I know people who, who have to some extent built careers of a sort by the fact that Jordan Peterson hates them. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's, that is, that's not, yeah, no, that's part of the whole dynamic where half the time now the goal is being hated by the right people. It's a non-zero sum relationship. I mean, this goes way back. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, uh, in a certain sense, you know, Bibi Netanyahu and the supreme leader in Iran have a non-zero sum relationship. I mean, they are they benefit from the antagonism. But politically, they benefit from the antagonism between the two countries. Um, and in general, you know, you, you, this is an age old dynamic. But there's some I, I just think more and more people have been drawn into it by social media. Um, so so social media has gets a lot to blame here. But. I wonder if this is true of a politics more generally. So I made this argument in a paper a while ago, but everybody, every social psychologist points out our political views are presumably in show human irrationality at its worst. We don't know what uh, we, you know, I'm a Democrat, but I don't actually know what the Democrats stand for. Um, people say, claim to have strong views on cap and trade. Then you ask them, what's cap and trade? They say, I don't know. Um, they, they believe the most ridiculous things about their enemies. They think, you know, Obama was, was, was born in Kenya. Then there was a poll and an enormous amount of Democrats thought Trump was born in Kenya and <laughs> endlessly like this. No one, you know, incredibly unsophisticated. And my view is this all looks stupid if you think what they're trying to do is strive for truth. But that's actually an irrational for, for, for national politics. Getting things right doesn't really matter. What people are trying to do in their political views is affiliate 
get social benefit, affiliate. And from that lens, people don't look so stupid anymore. Yeah, no, and this, I mean, uh, you know, if you take evolutionary psychology seriously, why would you expect people to be truly motivated by the pursuit of the truth, right? They they are, in theory, you know, uh, human nature to the extent that it has a genetic co- component should be uh, uh, designed to get you to do things that in the environment of our evolution, at least, uh, something maybe more like a hunter-gatherer environment, would have tended to get our genes into the next generation, some and often yeah. seeing things clearly yeah. uh, will will do that. You know, you you, um, you want to have a, a pretty accurate visual representation uh, of, of reality, and you often want to be able to size things up accurately. But in cases where exaggeration, uh, even in reconstructing your own memories, will yeah. be to your advantage, uh, then you might expect that people will design to do that without even realizing they're do- doing it. And that's, that's the, 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 yes. the most, uh, stubborn and, and kind of treacherous part of the problem. And in that regard, politics is a lot like romance and sex and child raising. You know, somebody goes up to their child and says, you know, I love you more than anybody else in the world. You are like a fantastic kid. And then a social psychologist walks by and say, that's irrational. There's so many better kids than that. Even on this block, there are better kids than that. (laughs) Well, the person, the father's not being irrational. The father is not aspiring towards an accurate evaluation of the children in the immediate vicinity. What he's doing is calibrating his love for the kid and expressing it. Um, and, and falling in love with all of its attendant um, people like Steve Pinker and Robert Frank are very good on this, pointing out that sort of the seeming irration, irrationality of falling in love and courting often are just exactly what you would want for the goals of sex and love and relationships. Yeah, and I mean, there are all kinds of realms in which our irrationality is not objectionable. I mean, it, it, it just my caring more about the welfare of my own offspring, uh, I don't think it aligns me with moral truth in any ultimate sense, but it's a kind of a reasonable way to construct society that the people who are living in your house, you care about a lot, right? That, yes. that That's a lot better than not giving a shit about them and having to have some government agency who will, who will, you know, show up every, every day and, and, and take care of them. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I, I'm not in an all out war against human <laughs> nature happily because I would lose. But, but I, I, at the same time, I think a certain amount of human moral progress consists in, um, recognizing some of its less fortunate implications in, in whatever environment you find yourself at that moment in history. Um, and, uh, and maybe trying to transcend them to the extent that that's possible. Yeah. And that's your, that's your line in your, in your Buddhism book where, you know, you, you, Maybe I don't know whether you put it this way, but I think you view um, Buddhism as a way to fight natural selection. Yeah, I, it, yeah, it's a kind of a rebellion against our Creator in a certain in a certain sense, and and, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's fair. No. Well, and and I mean you too. I mean, as long as we're doing these these uh, mutual book light, plugs, light let's make them mutual. Let's them. make them mutual. Damn it, your book right. against empathy. I mean, yes. uh, you know, it, it is it is natural to feel. Uh, what was the name of the kid trapped in the well in West Texas? Jessica, baby Jessica, or something? Yeah, that's it. That's you it, remember yeah. the one yeah. in Midland, Texas, or something? Yeah. Some, somewhere around there. I've lived in Midland. Uh, was never trapped in a well, but anyway, you point out in the book. The amount of resources, I, I mean, uh, you know, the amount of attention. It was a dramatic story. They finally got the kid out of the well. But like, meanwhile, you know, how many how many kids died in how many countries who could have benefited uh, from some of the attention that was uh, focused on baby Jessica? I was once asked uh, if I could put anything on a billboard, what would it be? And, and it I would be thinking- it would be screw baby Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let the kid die. Yeah, <laughs> no, it would be more general. It would be be that, but phrase more generally. Don't listen to your heart. Ah, uh. and because your heart is, as what I'm telling you, this is been shaped by by natural selection for certain purposes, and actually, in some domains like the family friendship, it guides you very well. 
But yeah. in a world full of billions of strangers, it is it is morally monst- monstrous. Yeah. And don't even get me started talking about foreign policy and the number of uh, uh, wars that have been started, in part by the advocates of the war, um, pointing to the real or imagined uh, suffering of various people. Uh, there was a famous case where this uh, witness uh, claimed that Iraqi soldiers had been unplugging incubators and putting the babies on the floors to die. That turned out to be a complete lie. Yeah. Not that a lot of bad things weren't going on uh, under Saddam Hussein, God knows. So, so Paul, you know, you were on uh, the Very Bad Wizards podcast, and you talked about William James in yes. a way that is relevant to uh, evolutionary psychology. Um, uh, you and, and, the, and the host, David and Tamler, um, I think kind of agreed that William James was one hell of a great psychologist, right? And, 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 and the question arose is, has psychology even made any significant advances since, since, since he wrote his assessments of human psychology now, I guess, more than a century ago, for the most part, uh, yeah. based I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but based largely on acute introspection, right? I mean, he, yeah. he, that, he that was his one of his main methodologies. Uh, it has that in common with 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 Buddhism in a way, in the sense that uh, Buddhist psychology grows a lot out of the observations of people who sat and meditated a long time. Yes. Uh, he didn't necessarily do that, but he paid a lot of attention to what was going on in his mind. There was a lot of introspection, a lot of. Uh anecdote some of these wonderful introspective moments like he talks about um about how once one requires a habit and a house and a partner one is tired and then for the rest of one's life you don't bother looking anymore and okay you know that's it and a lot of observations about other people some of the stuff was as you find in that time uh, sort of quasi scientific. There's, there's always these delightful passages. Passages like, "Oh, I read a letter from a Mr. Burroughs, you know, who went into the woods of uh, the, the woods of, this, of, of Papua New Guinea and discovered this most remarkable thing." And he tells us about it. It's very much in the style of a, of, of Darwin as well. Yeah. And um, Principles of Psychology, his great book, was written in 1890. I'd never read it. And uh, on this their podcast, Very Bad Wizards, they're talking about his chapter on habit. And I listened to my hat. That's great. So I contacted them. I said, could I, could I talk about other stuff? And, and um, William James has a chapter on instinct. And we had a great discussion of that. And there's a lot we know that would have knocked William James' socks off. There's a lot we know about the mind. We certainly know tons more about the brain than he did. There's a lot we know about, um, about visual perception, about... Um, our understanding of objects, language, um, how memory works, mm-hmm. the appetites, and so on. And there's a lot of the book you're reading, William James, and you're thinking, huh, yeah, we have not progressed beyond that. Like, he has these interesting, important suppositions about instincts and about the, the moral emotions and the moral nature. And I'm saying, that's really interesting. Somebody should study that. And um, and it is, a, it is a sobering reminder how how much psychology has to go. Mm-hmm. I, I think one, uh, I actually think evolutionary psychology represents one distinct advance that, I, I mean, I think if you would ask him certain kinds of questions, he wouldn't have had an, an answer. Uh, and, and sometimes these are in the realms of kind of ultimate explanation as opposed to yes. proximate. So, so like if, if you had said, I mean, he's the kind of guy who who, who might well have noticed that Often male and female jealousy assume different forms. There, there, there are different kind of statistical patterns uh, in the extent to which um, men as opposed to women focus on surely sexual infidelity as opposed to emotional infidelity. And so we needn't get into the details, but but there is at least a plausible ev psych explanation for that. I don't think James would have been able to guess that, even though it's, it's a very straightforward explanation. But I, I but think he was influenced to some extent by Darwin. Right, Darwin but Darwin didn't sense. understand that. Darwin, yeah. uh, it, yeah. it was all, not until the Trivers paper in the 1970s, and even well, there are earlier, uh, there are earlier people who may have picked up on it a little, uh, uh, maybe even George Williams in the 60s. But, um, but, but, and even Trivers didn't formulate it quite right in retrospect. But, but, it's one of those things. Darwin had uh, he, he he had seen the 
he, he didn't have the explanation. Well, well, actually, no, he definitely didn't have a jealousy explanation. Darwin didn't even have uh, the explanation for um, uh, the how selective males versus females are about strictly uh, sexual encounters and so uh, mates and strictly sexual encounters and so on. That whole realm, he tried to come up with an explanation there and didn't. So, um, anyway, I, I, I think there's no, a whole... I, I agree with you. I agree with you. James sometimes talked in Darwinian ways on the fear of heights and talks about how well it could sensibly evolve to be a growth fear of heights because of the advantage it gives you and so on. When it comes to things, to, to sort of insights involving parental investment and um, reciprocal altruism and stuff, James uh, yes. just didn't have the theoretical edifice to work right. on it. So like the whole suite of emotions that can plausibly attribute, be attributed to the, the evolution of reciprocal altruism, I don't think he would have understood that. So, That's right. But but right. it's 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 true that he was so good that it's not that easy to to come up with, you know, areas of huge, with things that would shock him, I guess. It uh, would, you know, I could imagine teaching a seminar where we just read the principles of psychology and then we talk about what we've learned since James and what we've yet to know. Mm-hmm. And and I can't imagine this is why psychology, you know, so many colleagues want to say psych insist that psychology is a science and technically psychology is a science, but it's not a science like physics or, or, or biology or chemistry. It's, it's, it's a, um, it's a fragile science. One phrase has it. And, and I don't think in these other fields, you can go back to a book written over a century ago and say, this is neat stuff, maybe of historical value, but it's not going to be saying, wow, this is a better theory than what we have now. Right, except in areas where we seem to have hit a wall, like quantum physics, like, there's no consensus on how to interpret quantum physics that has advanced, I think, beyond what, where they were, uh, you know, 80 years ago. Um, not a consensus. There may be new views, but it's like basically people are still scratching their heads about the, the kind of how to explain quantum phenomena in, in kind of, common sense terms that make sense but but uh but i agree i agree so did you did you you mentioned uh the philip roth uh biography and that whole controversy did you yes was there anything uh you wanted to say about that oh gosh i Um, I, see i've never read philip roth are you a philip roth reader yeah tell me what's so great about him for starters because i think maybe it was once i heard I guess was it Port Noise complaint that was so much about masturbation, or is that a, a, a more ongoing yeah, theme? But that just kind of yeah. left me like I, I you know, I, I probably heard about this at a young age, and I thought, you know, I, I think I already know about that. Thanks. I don't. Yeah, I, I read Port Noise complaint quite late. I read, but um, he's a wonderful writer. He's a very astute observer of American life and American Jewish life, and um, and he's just a wonderful storyteller. Like I'm listening right now on my audiobook to, to the Zuckerman series, Zuckerman Unbound. Mm-hmm. And it's, just, it's one, it, a lot of, he has a lot of metafiction, you know, in the counter life, his character, he meets a character known as Philip Roth, who lives in Israel and does stuff. And there's multiple cells. Some of his work is terrible. Some of his work, like a uh, Sabbath theater is, is grotesque yet wonderful. So I'm a big fan. I found a biography interesting. I found, um, even before the accusations came out, you can really see the biographer took took Ross' side on a lot of his relationships, describing his ex wife extremely unflatteringly. But it was a very good biography, and I enjoyed it. Um, I have mixed feelings about it being um, disappeared because of the biographer's crimes. I don't know how much you followed it, but he was yeah. um, accused of rape, and there is actually more and more stuff coming out that sounds truly awful. Is and that it, right? Because yeah, I there was a... I mean, I heard the initial, I gather it's a weird thing where like, so he was a junior high teacher. So he was teaching girls. Mid- middle school, uh, middle school, I guess. Middle school, so okay. Didn't... And he didn't prey on them at that point, but he cultivated relationships that endured until they were 18. Yes. And then he had sex with them, I gather. That's the accusation. Uh, and it's interesting that you say that the, the, the accusations are being corroborated, co- corroborated because I thought I saw something in some IDW-related venue like maybe Quillette where it could be it's not Quillette I could be wrong but somebody was 
saying, you know, oh, it's looking like they were a little too quick to judge. This case is more complicated. Some anti-cancel culture person was, yeah. I think, kind of springing to his defense. But you're saying that not so fast on the springing to the defense, it sounds like. I should, I should you know, hold up to the virtues I raised at the beginning and be more more generous and say, and say I don't know. I, I, there have been, he's been accused of two sorts of things. One is what you're describing as grooming these younger girls and mm-hmm. then entering in consensual sexual relationships with them later on. Um, and then he's also been accused of sexual assault of, of, of different women, including some, including some of these girls. So these are two independent accusations. I think they're worth separating because it's not clear that this sort mm-hmm. of grooming would be a legal matter as opposed to a deeply moral matter. Mm-hmm. Well, rape is, you know, obviously criminal and, and presumably I can imagine be criminal case against us. But so what I'm not sure is there's two aspects of it. One is the book is not going to be sold sold anymore. Yeah. The and biography. I, I yeah. don't know what to think of this. And I wonder what if instead of being accused of rape, he was credibly accused of murder and was now going to prison for murder. Would they still take the book out? I'm uh I'm thinking about that guy that Norman Mailer got out of jail. Do you remember this case? Jack Abbott. Wow, yeah. that's impressive. That, that, I'll tell you, the Zoom, the Zoom feature doesn't just make you look younger. <laughs> it makes your brain younger. That was an amazing act of recall. I have somebody behind the screen, actually, and they're feeding me stuff. That's, I wish I could afford such a person. <laughs> so, so, yeah, Jack Abbott, he had been a prisoner. I guess he had gotten in a correspondence with Mailer. Mailer said, hey, this guy has literary talent. Now, I don't know if Mailer somehow helped him get out of jail, but anyway... He gets out of jail. He's celebrated. I don't know if he wrote a book. Anyway, and then he kills somebody, right? He gets in a fight and stabs somebody to death or something. Yeah. And it's like, hey, maybe we should have left him in prison, Norman. Of course, Norman was no stranger to stabbing people. I think he stabbed a wife with scissors or something. But the um, – anyway, sorry about that digression. If it has some relevance to what you're saying. uh, It is relevant. I just – there's two things which puzzle me. One thing is – um, when accusations come up against a writer or a person, is the idea that, that an organization should investigate it before proceeding with that person, uh-huh. not over an internal matter. Like if I'm accused of, uh, of, you know, attacking my students or ridiculing my colleagues, of course, my university should investigate me. But what if I'm accused of, um, of uh, beating up somebody in a bar fight? And they call up Yale and I say, this guy beat somebody up in a bar fight for no reason. It's sadistic bully. Does he, should Yale then do an investigation? Should my publisher do an investigation? And I just, I'm not sure what to do about these things. And I'm also not sure about the idea of, of taking something away from print. I mean, somewhere here is mine come by somebody who's certifiably a very bad person. Yeah, really, now. I think if you're going to cancel people, Hitler probably should be before this guy. Uh, bad is what this guy did may have been. Now, that's a good point. I mean, in general, if you really were to go back and erase the works of people who did truly reprehensible, horrible things, you would you would lose some of the canon. Um, I think it was. Uh, I'm actually going to. I'm going to quickly get this because I don't want to get the person's name wrong. Um, yes, um, Alice Walker has been very credibly and, and basically had a New York Times interview where she she put her full hearted support for a Holocaust denier. You know, she yeah, she also has this, her. doesn't she have a, a particular th- theory of anti or, or variant of anti-Semitism associated with lizard people or something? It's, it's, it's the lizard man theory. Uh-huh. Um, super intelligent alien lizards things. Anyway, so that seems pretty bad. Is is the color purple being removed from bookshelves? I don't, I don't, you know, I just... I understand that this goes back to try. Norton is trying to, to express his disapproval of what this guy did. And that's, right. that's very understandable. And they figure this is a good way to, this is a good way to do it. And, and by the lack of complaints, I assume it is a good way to do it. I just, I'm not, I don't like have a settled view on this, but, but it strikes me as wrong. It strikes me that you can say, this person is a vile person, should spend the rest of her life in prison, whatever. But yeah, we're still going to publish his biography. Yeah. I guess, I mean, there is a distinction between the question I raised about how we treat, you know, old books whose authors are dead and how we treat yes. 
books of authors who can profit, I, I guess part of the idea is this person should not profit in any sense because we want to yeah. punish this person. And if a, you, uh, at least that argument makes more sense when the person's still alive. I'll say that for it, whether or not it makes sense. But I'm not generally a fan of this. I mean, Woody Allen, I consider that case wide open personally. I think if, if you feel sure you know that he's guilty or innocent, you're confused. It just seems to me the kind yeah. of case where everything we know about psychology makes it hard to say, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, uh, but, um, you know, he was in effect canceled. I mean, he, he had written this whole book and, uh, I think he had a publisher who he did. deep six, little, little Brown, Brown maybe. Yeah. yeah. But, but, um, yeah, it's a thing. It's not the end of the world that if we don't have Woody Allen's autobiography, um, but, uh, I don't know. It's, it's strange times. Um, so I don't know what else. How long have we been doing this? It, time flies when you have fun. Uh, yes. Anything else you want to? Um, the uh, you've told me what's good about Philip Roth. See, I just haven't um, read that much fiction. Period. I must admit. Really? Um, you, you seem so literate. Uh, so far from the truth. Um, nice of you to say it. The. Uh, Oh, final psychology question for you. Okay. By the way, I, we were once having a discussion, and at the end, you asked me a statistics question. Out of the blue. Out of the blue. said, like, you know, well, if you have multiple tests and you do this, and, and I'm like, I, I think so. And I've always been embarrassed by it. I hope no one ever sees it. I wish I could remember the question. I'd ask it again and humiliate you a second time. Yes. But go on. Ask me Maybe the new that. the new Zoom version of your brain would be able to answer it. <laughs> They're frantically typing back there. Uh, no, it's just like I heard a whole podcast. It gets back to the cognitive bias question. I think we still uh, there's some work that could be done sorting out these cognitive biases and their interconnection. But it was negativity bias, and yeah. I wonder about the utility of that as a really broad term. I mean, th this this guy was using it to explain. I think it was about it encouraging wars because you pay more attention to bad things that you're uh, a nation you're suspicious of is doing or something. But but clearly there isn't like a universal negativity bias. I mean, for example, uh, you know, men. Uh, heterosexual men viewing a female face, a, a, a new female face from afar, uh, will judge it more favorably on average than they will once it comes closer. In other words, they're erring on the side of, yes, I would find this woman attractive. It's, it, that's a positivity bias. It makes sense in a certain, you could yeah. at least come up with a plausible explanation. Who knows if it is in fact in the genes and, and that explanation is right. But, but there's no doubt that, it's an experimental finding, and it's one of various, you know, and, and various areas where there's actually a kind of positivity bias. So does yeah. a term like negativity bias, you tell me, is that really taken seriously in the literature as a generic thing? It is taken seriously. There's a lot of exceptions that you could think of. Um, one exception is, uh, is developmental, which is young children oh. seem to have an extremely positive view of people. Hmm. And... They tend to, well, to, yeah, because sort of, that's because they haven't spent much time in the world. <laughs> but but if the negativity bias is um, <clears throat> is defined as you take a good thing and then you take a bad thing, that's in some sense as bad as the good thing is good. The bad thing is going to be no, more noticeable. It's going to weigh more on you. But how um, do they how do they evaluate? How do they quantitatively do compare it? the two? That seems to me almost in principle impossible. Because the only empirical measurement of that would be how negatively or positively yes. do people react, and it would be redundant yes. to use yeah. that. I mean, that There's would be circular. Do, There's ways to do a consistent scale. Like, one is money. You know, you would feel worse if you lost $100, then you would feel good for getting $100. Okay, well, that's loss aversion. That's a little different. It may be, maybe not. Okay, I'll give you a question. This is actually, there's a wonderful preprint by Lucius Caviola uh, and his colleagues. I, we read in my lab, and it had, it had a great question in it. I'll ask you the question. Suppose you take, imagine the worst day you have ever had in your life. 
That would Imagine. be the day. Go ahead. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> It's only last like an hour and a half. That's, re- that's, that's, recent, that's recency bias. Yeah, it's recency bias. But imagine the worst. Imagine your best day of your life that you had had. Would you relive both of them? If you could get to relive hmm. the best day of your life hmm. at the cost of reliving the worst day of your life, would you no. do it? No. Most do people most people say no? say no? Most people say no. With good reason. Good reason, because <laughs> the, the worst day of my life is a lot worse than the than that. That's an interesting day. finding. Yeah, I, I would have thought it was just me. So I'm glad to hear everyone is like that. Or most everyone. people. Yeah, most it's people. psychology. So, you know. All the people I would hang out with, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look at it from a Darwinian point of view. All sorts of good things could happen to you right now. But there's nothing as good that could happen to you as the worst thing which could happen to you, which is you die. Actually, the worst thing that would happen is that I am Your taken to a black like site it. and tortured for the rest for, for eternity rather than just killed. But Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, I, we could end by talk, by just talking about another bias. Um, I'm not sure anybody's studied this systematically. I think so, but Cass Sunstein talks about it in um in an article called Moral Heuristics. It's a betrayal bias, and the idea of the betrayal bias is we are particularly bothered by negative outcomes caused by things that are put in to make our lives better. And so the standard example is people freak out about getting killed by earbags. It's sort of like, and isn't an ironic sort of thing, but they just hate being killed. They hate the idea of putting in their seatbelt and then the car's on fire and they can't escape. And they hate dying from vaccines. Hmm. They, they think dying from vaccines is worse than dying in other ways. Hmm. Because, and, and there's not that much science behind it, but the intuition is we feel betrayed. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, I was going to say with the seatbelt and airbags, there could also be an element of the government made me do yes. that. They made me have an airbag in my that's car. True. And I think that's a valid, that's a valid thing. It's like, if the government's going to yeah. force you to do something, it should have pretty low risk. A- yeah, and, and ideally, and if it doesn't have super low risk, it should at least have positive externalities in the sense. And that's what a vaccination has is like, it isn't just about yeah. you. It's like you're protecting other citizens and so on. But, um, yeah, uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm wondering what we'll talk about next time. I'm sure we'll come up with something. There's always stuff. Because you're, always, always, stuff. you're always stumbling into controversy. <laughs> I am. Also, in November, my new book will, will come out. And then oh, we'll have to ha- have you on then when, you, when your book, uh, The Sweet Spot, the sweet spot. The pleasures of suffering, the search for meaning. Thank you. Which gets into, you know, such things as sadism. It's very spicy. It's book. very spicy. Nope. You know, that's that itself is a clue to some one of the things you talk about in the book. Spicy. Yes. yes. Spicy. So, um, yeah. Well, I guess yeah, we should. We should. I guess discretion is a better part of valor. I, I could I could keep uh I could keep talking to you, but I guess maybe we should and- Quit while we haven't, uh, we think, said anything cancelable. And in about uh, an hour, I'm getting my first vaccine. Congratulate. So You're going to join the Pfizer last, tribe. Last you and I are going to be Pfizer mates, yeah, as I understand that's it. Right. That's right. And we will shower uh, scorn on yes. uh, the Moderna and J&J tribes. Yes, this is, um, this is, I got a small batch, Pfizer. It's really, it's really nice. It's going to be yeah. great. Yeah, great. Yeah, so I'll see if they give them both. You know, I want them both at once, actually, just because I'm a busy man. Why don't you? Why don't you just say that? Maybe they'll do it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I had to go on two separate occasions. Yeah. It was a great Most experience. I got to say, it was like I was in a. It was like one of these National Guard setups, and uh, so a lot of people in this huge space, long winding lines. And it's like. All these people who voted for different people, but at that moment, we were all happy to be Americans. It was great. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's touching. I thought I'd close on a touching note, but it was. That's, be- that's beautiful. Thank you. I, I, we've seen the movie Contagion. I'm sure you've seen it. I saw it and on an airplane without uh, – I didn't want to pay for the soundtrack, but I got the idea. <laughs> you do a like, series of it's film, about germs, a right? Reviews. It's about a deadly yeah. germ. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, anyway, they had a, a, a vaccine delivery system at the end where they did it over the span of a year, and they had to lottery based on birthdays. And this has gone much better, much quicker. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't. I, I didn't want to be in the reality of that movie, as I recall. This is better yeah. than being in that movie. Um. Okay. Well, thank you. Hey, can, enjoy your vaccine. Thank you. And uh, uh, we will we will see you sometime between now and the pub date of your book. In thank the fall. you. Thank you. And this has been tons of fun as always. Has been as always. All right. We will see you.